Today, we're taking a look at the XFX Speedster Series Mercury 310 7900 XTX Black graphics card. And that'll be the first time and the last time I use it by its full name because it's a bit of a mouthful. It's also a very big card with a lot of features to talk about. But before we get into that, here's a quick word from this video sponsor. Hello, mate. You all right? Yeah, just got all the bits from my banging new gaming PC. Just got to put it together. It's going to be so much better than yours. Oh, right. What did you get then? The latest Intel 12th gen processor, a feature packed motherboard and 32 gig of DDR4 memory. See, miles ahead of yours. <laughs> you, you realize that board needs DDR5 memory, don't you? Don't tell me you went and bought the wrong stuff. DDR4 is so 2014. I can't believe you was that stupid. <gasps> what? No, you're joking. What should I get then? For me, I'd be looking at Corsair's newest Vengeance DDR5 kits, or if you're wanting that all important RGB, then go for the Dominator Platinum RGB. Oh, you are a lifesaver, thanks. But where can I find out more? By clicking the link in the description below, of course. <laughs> you call me the stupid one. So, the XFX 7900 XTX. Right now, it's their top tier model. Though it wouldn't surprise me if a water block card comes along at a later date in collaboration with EK. For now, we have a big card with a pretty sleek design. I've always been a fan of the cards from XFX over the last couple of years because they've kind of ditched the whole gamery aesthetics in something kind of, you know, favor of looking more workstation focused, which gives off a kind of premium vibe with the smallest amount of LED lighting and none of that RGB nonsense that a lot of people dislike. Don't get me wrong, I love me some RGB, but I also get that it's not for everyone. And I think that's why XFX have kept it simple and very clean with the 7900 XTX Black Edition. And that's not a bad thing. The card, as I mentioned, is large, as it has to house the three 100mm dual ball bearing fans and the mammoth finned block and vapor chamber heatsink. Now, from the offset, the cooler on this card looks like a beast, and hopefully it is. So, I mentioned it's large, and it actually does put some 40 series cards to shame. Coming in at 344mm long, 128mm high, including the PCI Express connector, and 57mm thick. So it will take up just under three slots in your case, which may cause some issues with installation, so be sure to check that out first. Now, I won't lie and say it's a light card, because it's not, at 2135 grams which is 70 grams more than the AMD reference card and 375 grams more than the Power Color Hellhound that we looked at recently. That weight isn't all smoke and mirrors though, as the card feels like it's built like a tank. And you'll see what I mean as we break the card down. Being heavy and solid would normally put fear of potential sagging issues, but there is literally no flex in the card at all. It really is solid, though XFX do still include a Z bar for extra support that screws into the IO bracket and at the end of the card. And well, you yeah, know, it's a lot better than them flagpole type ones. The main shroud is made from a single piece of aluminium that's molded around the heatsink with contrasting black and metallic looking silver around the edge and around the fans, which do include smart cooling detection, which will work to automatically adjust the fan speed during load. Now I will admit, I love the sleek and kind of clean look of the card, but I'm a little unsure as to the design choice on the center of the fans. I don't know, it just looks a little kind of out of place and almost like a laughing emoji. I don't know, is it just me? The top of the card is where we find the shroud wrapping around the edge of the heatsink and our first glimpse of the die cast backplate with a small amount of kind of radion branding. There's also an LED XFX logo that lights up white for a little splash of color. And then on the opposite end, we find a BIOS switch that allows you to swap between the OC BIOS and full power BIOS, which are rated at 327 and 339 watts respectively. Though XFX do claim that though the higher power limit is based on AMD's recommendations, there are a few variables to it. So if you wanna get it fully stable and things like that, yeah, it's gonna come down to silicon lottery and things like that. And really it is recommended for overclocking enthusiasts only. Now, the strange thing here is that the card has three 8-pin power connectors, which even if we use the conservative 150 watts per connector, even though technically it's 342 watts, we can actually pull much higher, coupled with a PCI Express slot power, and you're actually looking at a maximum potential draw, based on 150 per connector, of 525 watts. 
So why has the card got three connectors instead of two? It really could just come down to splitting the load. Now each BIOS has slightly different speeds too, with a 2455MHz game clock and 2615MHz boost clock when in OC mode, while the full power mode cranks things up to 2510MHz on the game clock and 2680 on the boost clock. Now the backplate is very industrial looking and very, very thick. I actually think it's the thickest backplate I've seen on a GPU in quite some time and features a kind of nice ridge design, which I'm sure is to aid with heat dissipation and not just for style and looks. It also takes up the whole length of the card beyond the PCB where it has a small cutout for airflow and heat to pass through. Now at the very end of the card, we find a small opening which should help with airflow passing through to the main part of the cooler, as well as mounting holes for that included Z support bar for extra stability. On the IO, we find a small amount of ventilation and a single HDMI and triple DisplayPort ports that we've seen on other custom AIB cards, unlike the reference AMD card, which also had a Type-C port too. Taking the card apart is fairly easy with six hidden screws behind the three fans to remove the outer shroud. There's a single fan connector that needs removing from the PCB and it comes apart. There's also four screws to remove the cooler from the GPU core and a further seven screws to remove the heatsink from the PCB, all of which are located on the rear of the card. With a little light pressure, the card should then come apart revealing another nine screws for the backplate. This then allows you to separate the backplate from the PCB, which is fairly large due to the triple eight pin connectors though there is a small unused area on the right side of the PCB due to its size. Much like other AIB models, the XFX card comes with 20 power phases that split between 17 phases for the GPU and three phases for the memory. The GPU phases are managed by the Monolithic Power Systems MP2857 controller, while the memory is controlled by the Monolithic Power Systems MP2856 controller. And all 20 phases are Monolithic Power Systems MP87997 components and are all rated at 70 amps of current each. So identical to the Power Color Hellhound that we looked at recently, but this has much higher power limits. Now the heatsink is comprised of two components, the first being the large finned heatsink, which spans the whole of the card, while the second is a nickel plated copper vapor chamber base plate, which makes direct contact to the GPU core, the memory, and the individual power phases, which uses a total of eight six millimeter heat pipes to transfer heat away to the ends of the heatsink. XFX have also utilized the backplate as a heat spreader by adding in thermal pads to various locations on the PCB and have increased the surface area by 33% when compared to the previous generation flagship. So on paper, it all seems to tick the right boxes and having such a mammoth cooler, I'm expecting good results in terms of cooling and overall performance. But first, let's take a look at what kind of out of the box performance looks like compared to other 7900 XTX cards, as well as other comparative cards. Kicking things off with Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, and straight away the faster boost speed really comes into play, with a 4% improvement over the reference AMD card in the averages, and a 6% uplift in the 1% lows. It's a similar story in Cyberpunk, where the XFX card now comes in 4% faster in the averages, which puts it within touching distance of the RTX 4080 FE from Nvidia, while also coming in with just under 2% better dips in the 1% lows. Death Stranding wasn't as much of a standout with less than 2% separating the reference card with the XFX model and with the MSRP based Hellhound card from Powercolor sitting in between. The 1% lows were a little stronger, but again, at less than 2%, you could deem it as margin of error anyway. Lastly, in Watchdog Legion, we see the XFX card returning to form, coming in 4% faster than the reference 7900 XTX from AMD. And again, with the MSRP based Powercolor card sitting between them. Okay, so there's a small uplift in performance around 4% in a small selection of games, but at what cost? Well, the XFX Merc 310 will set you back another 10% over an MSRP based card like the AMD Reference or Powercolor Hellhound Scoots, cementing itself at $1,099. But it's not as clear cut as that because there's other metrics to factor in, such as cooling. And with this being such a large card with pretty serious kind of cooling solution, I'm expecting good things. And what we found during a run of F122 was the GPU temperature sitting around 54 degrees, which is dramatically lower than the 66 degrees we saw on both the AMD reference and power color cards. Not stopping there, but the memory junction temperature also came in cooler by around 10 degrees at 80 degrees, and the hotspot also remained in check at 72 degrees, which is a whopping 20 degrees lower than the other 7900 XTX cards that we've already tested. During this, the GPU clock managed to get to around 2550 MHz at 100% usage, while the total board power remained around 390 watts, with the fans hovering around 1600 RPM, which is barely audible, I guess you could say. 
So with a GPU that's able to be so cool during stock operation, you'd like to think that overclocking would be pretty plentiful due to the headroom that's available. But with the 7900 XTX and RDNA 3 as a whole, it's not quite as clear cut due to the way that power is harnessed and what that means for pushing it to its limits. Throughout our own testing, we actually found the best thing to do is to raise the power limit, put a small overclock on the memory and potentially on the core, and undervolt the card to maintain stability. Raising the boost clock range didn't really seem to garner much performance, if any, and in some cases actually saw performance worsen due to extra heat that's added. And it's pretty much the same story for the memory. With that in mind, we did manage to push the power limit to the max, undervolt the card by around 50 millivolts, and increase the core clock max frequency by 75 megahertz, and the memory clock by around 100 megahertz to get the kind of best balance between performance and stability. And this was pretty much a similar story with the previous generation of AMD cards too. What this resulted in, at least in terms of cooling performance, was a four degree increase, now up to 58 degrees on the GPU temperature, while the memory junction temperature increased to around 86 degrees, which both temperatures are still cooler than the other 7900 XTX cards that we've looked at, and they were at stock. Now, the hotspot did increase, but was still under control at 79 degrees, which was still dramatically less than, again, what we had seen on other cards. Clock speed wise, there were moments where we found it to rise above 2800 megahertz during a extended level of gameplay at 100% GPU utilization. Clock speed wise, there were moments where we found it to rise above 2800 megahertz during an extended level of gameplay at 100% GPU utilization. Due to the increased power limits, the total board power was now coming out around the 450 watt mark, while the fans remained around the same at 1600 RPM. What this means in games is that in Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, we see just under a 9% uplift in performance in the averages and just over 9% in the 1% lows, which is pretty impressive considering the temperatures were still well under control. In Cyberpunk, the gain from overclocking was much smaller at just under 2% in the averages, while the 1% lows actually dropped by two frames per second, likely due to the extra heat not allowing the same level of boost for a sustained amount of time. Death Stranding saw a healthy improvement by 4% in the averages, which also led to a 5% increase over the AMD reference card. The 1% lows also saw an increase of just under 2%, but such a high frame rate is nothing you'd ever really notice. Lastly, in Watch Dog Legion, we saw a similar 4% uplift when overclocking in the averages and a slightly healthier 5% increase in the 1% lows, now putting the XFX card 9% faster than the AMD reference card, which also had higher temperatures under stock operation. So, the XFX 7900 XTX. It's definitely shown what's capable with the new RDNA 3 architecture and harnessed the true potential of the GPU in a pretty slick package. I think it's safe to say that I expected good things from the card from the offset due to the sheer size and weight of it, and it definitely delivered on all fronts. Now, style-wise, the only gripe I really have is the design on the fans and the fact that the card is on the bigger end of the scale, but it shows that not all of that was a lost effort and actually does amount to remaining cool and quiet during operation. The temperatures that the GPU delivered really show that XFX have done quite a lot of work behind the scenes that, again, has paid off, including increasing the size and thickness of the backplate, putting thermal pads on there, implementing automatic fan sensors that adjust based on temperature, while still maintaining a fairly inaudible noise level. Kind of loads of different things going on, and it's all amounted to something pretty impressive. Now, in terms of overclocking, it's still a bit of an unknown as to if there is a better let's call it sweet spot, more so than what we already found. But it does seem, at least to me, that there is a little room, but even like processors, undervolting may be the way forward to get that kind of slight boost in performance in favor of just clocking things to the max. Yes, all of this will cost you an extra kind of 10% over an MSRP card like the AMD reference or PowerColor Hellhound models, but I'm okay with that. Yes, I do wish the 7900 XTX as a whole was maybe slightly cheaper, maybe $100 cheaper, but it still comes in cheaper than the RTX 4080. So yeah, I guess it's a decision that comes down to each individual as to if they're already looking to spend that kind of money, would you rather maybe spend a little extra and get something a little better? I'm not saying that the AMD reference card is bad because it's not, but this just takes it one step further. I'm still actually looking forward to seeing an XFX EK love child that could take those boost figures and, you know, go crazy with them, especially with the news floating around of crazy boost speeds of 3200 megahertz and above. Is this likely what we're going to see from a water block card? I don't know. 
hopefully we can get one in to look at and maybe we'll make some content really going through the ups and downs of overclocking on RDNA 3 because it does at least seem to get to a point and then start decreasing in performance as the temperatures rise even higher. Again, it's trying to get that balance. So let me know if that's something you want to see. For now, what do we think of the XFX card? Is it what you expected or have the cool and calm temperatures actually surprised you? For me, it most definitely did. It's a big card, but it delivers in a big way. So that makes it okay in my book. And there we have it. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, a like and a sub to the channel would be amazing. And if you love what we do, then consider supporting us over on Patreon. You'll get a ton of super cool benefits, including behind the scenes content, access to our super special secret area on Discord, a live Patreon only Q&A session that we're gonna be starting in the new year, and much, much more. The link for all that is down below. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you in the next one. See you later, guys.